Hello, it's Heather from the Sunshine and Power Cats podcast. In association with Geeks Rising from the 10th to the 16th of August or 11th to the 17th if you're here in New Zealand, we are hosting the second 2019 Sunshine Summit. It's a week of live streams with amazing content creators and their communities with the theme of celebrating connections. All of the details for the upcoming summit, as well as replays from our previous events and where the live streams will be happening, can be found at sunshinesummit.live. A huge thank you to the patrons of Sunshine and Power Cuts for making it possible. So check it out, and if you know our guests, we'd love for you to come and celebrate with us. And if they're new to you, come along and learn more about them, and we look forward to celebrating connections with you. I'm Josh Liston from On The Bubble Podcast an oral history of television fandom. Part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at gunnageeknetwork.com. And welcome to Play Comics, a show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. I'm Chris, and today I have the beginning of the Origins series that I have been pumping up for I have no idea how long at this point with some of my favoriteest people in podcasting, Miles Stokes and Matt Hunter from J. Miles Explain the X-Men. Hey Chris, thanks for uh, for having me on again, and uh, for having Matt and I on together. It's, I'm I'm excited to talk about some X Men beating the hell out of each other. Yeah, very, very excited. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I don't nearly get enough time in front of a microphone, so any chance uh, to talk about comic books and video games, I will I will jump on that. Well, I'm glad I can hit both of you up for this. I'm really excited for it. <laughs> so, for anybody who doesn't know about it, why don't you tell them a little bit about Jay Miles? Explain the X Men. So Jay and Miles explain the X-Men. We describe it as a weekly deep dive into the ins, outs, and retcons of comics' greatest superhero soap opera. Uh, Basically, Jay Edidin and I uh, try to detangle one of the most complicated comic book properties out there, talking about the chronology and the characters and the plots, but also all about kind of the social context and the politics, and we make a bunch of dumb jokes. And then Matt takes our inane ramblings and turns them into something that's actually uh, listenable by the public. I do my best. (laughs) Yeah, Matt, you've been our producer for a little over a year now, right? Yeah, a little over a year. Uh, I want to say, God, maybe like 60, 70 episodes, Mm -hmm. which blows my mind a little bit, but I think it's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. I know y'all do a great job. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. There have been many times where you guys are most of what I listen to all week long. (laughs) We do. um, We do come out with a lot of material. Like there's just so much X-Men stuff to talk about. Too much X-Men stuff to talk about. And uh, like, you know, to kind of like, you know, for, for a little bit of disclosure, like I came into this podcast as not completely unknowledgeable about the x-men i still read you know comics here and there and i was definitely familiar with the cartoon but the amount i learned about the x world is just i'm i'm, I'm still trying to like wrap my head around the enormity of, of of that universe and uh like let me tell you like editing these episodes and listening to these storylines and like all of these retcons that happen all these great characters uh is is a little bit of a revelation for me every time so it's it's super duper fun producing this podcast <laughs> I'm I'm so glad because yeah we, we definitely give you a, a, a lot to do on the show <laughs> not nearly as polished in the raw as it uh, comes out <laughs> no so today we're here to talk about children to the atom which ironically enough as we record this is about where miles and jr on their own show 
Exactly, yeah. Uh, we just finished covering a crossover from 1993 called Fatal Attractions, where Magneto steals a space station and brings all the worthy mutants to it, and uh, eventually everything goes horribly awry, and he rips out Wolverine's skeleton, and Xavier rips out Magneto's brain, and that all leads to Onslaught, which the less said the better. Uh, but, yeah, this game is loosely structured around Fatal Attractions. So what plot it has, which for a fighting game I guess is about an average amount of plot, is exactly that. We're not going to worry too much about getting into the Fatal Attractions thing here because in the end, it really doesn't matter in the context of the game. Yeah, I mean, really, it's just a uh, glorious excuse for a bunch of X-Men and X-Men villains to pummel each other in an incredibly over-the-top fashion. Yeah, fighting games kind of historically have eschewed the idea of a story or plot or any sort of coherence whatsoever um, for just, you know, the technical side of like gameplay and mm -hmm. and all of that. So interesting property to uh, choose to uh, uh, take that approach with, I think. It's true. Yeah. Taking one of the more complicated storylines. Well, I guess it's not as complicated as, say, Executioner, Song or Inferno, but still a complicated storyline and turning it into, you know, one of the more straightforward genres of gaming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it makes me wonder. Like, besides the fact that this was coming out in kind of that middle-ish, second, third of um, 93, can you think of any other reason why they would base the game around Fatal Attractions? I mean, I guess if you're going for a premise where a bunch of bad guys team up and the X-Men have to fight them, Fatal Attractions kind of works. You know, you have Magneto trying to gather the worthy mutants, and of course it's mostly going to be supervillains who uh, would, would agree to team up with him. But it's bizarre because of all the bad guys in this game... Um, the only ones who are directly aligned with Magneto are the Acolytes, these people who worship him, and the Juggernaut, who I have no idea why the Juggernaut would team up with Magneto, and the villains who are playable uh, are only about half mutants, and none of them are aligned with uh, the, the Master of Magnetism. So it's a part of me wonders if it was just, it was the 90s, this is a very 90s storyline, and that was most of it right there. Well, this game was also released uh, pretty not super quick, but like pretty early in the X-Men cartoon uh, kind of like timeline as well. So you can kind of get a sense as to like why they chose, uh, you know, maybe like a, a more comic centric storyline than a cartoon centric storyline. Mm -hmm. um, even though like, you know, you talk to people and the thing they remember about the X-Men is the cartoon in so many instances. So, um, you know, yeah, and and then you know, of course, the character design in the game uh, is very, very similar to the cartoon as well. So, oh yeah, those early '90s Jim Lee redesigns, yeah. like that is 100% what we're looking at. Yeah. And in fact, like a lot of the uh, victory and defeat portraits, I, I recognized so many of them, and I couldn't place specific uh, panels or issues or anything. But it was just pulling so directly from the Jim Lee and Jim Lee imitators era of of X Men. I mean, as did the cartoon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And really, you've got a pretty iconic set of characters from the hero side of things. Because you've got Colossus and Cyclops and Iceman and Psylocke, Storm and Wolverine. You know, there isn't really anybody I'd expect back to be there that isn't yeah i think those would have been some of the central characters as much as i would have loved to have seen bishop because i have so much love for lucas bishop and he's he's sadly largely forgotten but it was cool to see not just you know the super expected ones cyclops and wolverine but like characters like iceman and colossus who were really barely in the cartoon mm -hmm. and who weren't you know you were going to see colossus and iceman on lunch boxes and t-shirts at least by themselves in the 90s mm -hmm. so it was a nice little nod to some of the more important but less like uh, immediately marketable characters that were there and one thing i found really interesting uh spoiler alert for the end of children of the atom uh, <laughs> but you actually get to see forge make a guest appearance which yeah. was kind of nuts yeah yeah and storm's ending he just like shows up on a jetpack with his mustache and his ponytail yep. and uh they have like two lines and um it's that sort of thing that i do appreciate in games like this though when you have such a rich world such a rich setting from which to pull mm -hmm. like pulling in some of those things that your average player is not necessarily going to recognize because for me as a young x-men fan getting my exposure to the x-men franchise from all kinds of different directions including like passing by this game in the arcades mm -hmm. um 
it was always cool to see stuff I didn't recognize, and that would give me something to look into. And in an era where the internet was only barely a thing, that meant talking to friends, it meant looking at back issues, it meant trying to find trade paperbacks in your local comic shop. And so, you know, maybe there's somebody out there who was like, hey, I wonder who that mustache man is. Let me go read Fall of the Mutants and be very confused or something like that. <laughs> and thus a nerd is born. Oh, yes. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Every time a forge appears in an ending, a comic book fan gets their wings. And then over on the villain side of things, you've got Omega Red and a Sentinel because, you know, of course you have a Sentinel. Why wouldn't you? Silver Samurai, mm -hmm. Spiral, Juggernaut, and Magneto. Yeah, and that is an interesting collection of characters because there are so many iconic X-Men villains, and most of the ones that are appearing are, well, not that i mean spiral spiral has been a big deal in x-men for years and years she first appeared in the long shot miniseries one of my personal favorite series ever but she's an incredibly complicated strange character and to see her featured in a game with really not that many characters made me so happy and the fact that they stick spiral in the mojo world too you know this is just such a great place to be able to see that environment Oh, yeah. And I mean, uh, like like you and I were talking about on the um, Genesis X-Men uh, episode we did, Chris, like you can just pull from so many different settings and it, it's just, you know, whatever kind of setting you want, however much you want to juxtapose one very mundane setting or character with one truly bizarre setting or character, like you have those options. You can go in the Genesis game from the depths of Shi'ar space to the Excalibur lighthouse in England. And here, yeah, you can go from a character like Juggernaut, who's relatively straightforward, to a woman with six arms, furry boots, a history with long shot, uh, She's been altered psychologically and genetically and driven mad by being thrown into the time stream by her megalomaniacal cyborg media loving boss from an alternate dimension that is unique in the multiverse. Like you can dive into something that gloriously complicated and then distill it into this is a really weird looking level and this lady teleports around and turns into other people and I love it. Right next to somebody else who has their stage inside of an elevator. <laughs> yeah yeah that was something that um matt when you and i were talking about the game was very clear like the levels some are so mundane and some are so complex there's just such like a like a range between those poles yeah we were looking at uh colossus stage which was uh, a boat on a pier with sentinels in the background and it's just like okay you know like i guess this makes some sort of sense right and then you have you know at the other end uh, like you were saying, Chris, you have Mojo World, mm -hmm. where it's sort of this Salvador Dali meets a bad acid trip meets hell, where you just bust through the floor like three or four times into different increasingly bizarre levels of it. That was that was a really cool uh, kind of little discovery uh, when, you know, we found out that there was actually it's like more to the stage and like, you know, the, the 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 kind of like weird organic design just got, you know, more and more twisted as you fell down until uh, Mojo was holding his own head uh in the background it just got so weird but cool it reminded me a little of uh some of the old dark stalkers levels like i remember there was some yeah. kind of a big machine with like a giant demon baby inside of it just that level of almost hieronymus bosch level surreality mm -hmm. good game too i know and those crazy stages are one of the reasons why this is always one of the games me and my wife bring out to the front porch for halloween <laughs> <laughs> very nice I mean, unfortunately, we're bringing the PlayStation version out there, but I've got one of the little screens for the mm -hmm. PS1, and we'll sit out there so kids don't have to ring the doorbell and scare our cats. <laughs> right. It's a good plan. I like this. Yeah. You know, nice uh, nice October night, some fighting games, mm -hmm. giving out candy to children. This seems like a good way to spend uh, an evening. Yeah, definitely. I do want to acknowledge one thing here. There is a little comic run called Fatal Attractions. Has nothing to do with this at all. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, man. Yeah. So I was expecting, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm more familiar with uh, more modern fighting games uh, that have, you know, like maybe halfway through a little plot segment or maybe the characters will talk at the beginning of every match or something like that. But yeah, the plot in this game, like the Fatal Attractions bits, that's entirely limited to a very brief ending at the end of the arcade mode of each character. Like I was expecting to see more of a nod to it throughout the, the campaign, such as it is. Me too, because like even in Justice League Task Force, you've got whoever you're playing as asking all the other Justice League members what was going on. Yeah, so that, that did feel like a bit of a, a missed opportunity, I guess. And especially because like 
in those endings, the quality of the writing is actually pretty decent. Like, mm -hmm. I remember, Matt, you are saying that the characters really sounded like themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I Very specifically, when Storm had her, you know, very few lines, I really felt that, like, they kind of captured, like, her leadership her you know the kind of level of concern that she's capable of and you know kind of the maturity that she exhibits uh and you know basically like that for every character just a small amount of the character's voice i think goes a long way in a game like this because the endings were kind of worth it in a strange way they were kind of recycled as far as like animations and setup and how everything like that went. But, you know, being able to actually like dive into a little bit of a character's personality uh, when you actually finish the campaign, big heavy quotes around campaign, definitely, I think, you know, made it worthy of like an ending of a game. Yeah, yeah, I, w I would agree. Like it, that's where it started to really feel like X Men. And I mean, certainly with the um the the designs, the character designs, and the animation, and the choice of moves, like that's all very X Men. But getting in the feel of those extremely well known characters, even going so far as to bring in a lot of the voice actors from the cartoon, just added this level of uh, of immersion that even if in its very brief appearances at, in the endings or you know in people yelling the names of their moves, really added to the game. Yeah, I mean, is it really an X-Men game if you don't have Wolverine yelling Berserker Barrage the whole time? <laughs> oh, man. So I uh, I would mainly encounter this game in loud arcades when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so I got, like, all of the move names wrong. Um, so Berserker Barrage, I always heard as, this is a mirage. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, like, you're saying that you're, you're, you're attacking them so hard that they're not going to think it's real, maybe? I, I don't know. Like, it's almost an illusion. Or um, his Drill Claw, I always heard as Real Claw. Like, this is the real... <laughs> Real attack. This is the truest attack. Like I would, I would come up with these attempts at justifying what seem to be nonsensical move names. Mm -hmm. And see, with my history uh, playing Street Fighter with like you know Hadouken and Sharuken, I just thought it was just gibberish or you know just some, like a language I didn't understand. Right. So I thought he was saying Rimba Rimba Ra, <laughs> which I loved. I thought that was so cool because it was like, oh yeah, like of course he has this like gibberish language when he goes into a berserker rage. Yeah, it's like a speaking in tongues kind of thing. Exactly. Right? Yeah. No, it just kind of like it just just beefs up you know just what he already has going and uh, you know of course you know as a you know preteen. You don't really pay attention to stuff like that, especially when you're in the heat of the moment. So mm -hmm. I, I was also thinking like, so the those lines are the ones that are most memorable to me is because uh, the voice actor who plays Logan, I, I don't remember his name, but I believe it is the same one from the cartoon. Mm. And he just is Wolverine in my head straight up. Um, but I'm also thinking that Wolverine's probably of the X-Men, the least likely character to yell the names of his moves while he's doing them. <laughs> Now, Iceman, Iceman, I totally buy. I think oh, Iceman sure. would spend a lot of time in front of the mirror practicing yelling the names of his moves. You got that little bit of vanity necessary in order for him to kind of announce what he's doing as he's doing it. Oh, yeah. And, and sort of the insecurity that goes along with it. It's really important that uh, people are paying attention to him. And that's another great way that they can. And also the lack of strategy that Iceman uh, is maybe a little bit culpable of because uh, I, I could just kind of see like, you know, Cyclops taking him aside later on and be like, so... I notice you're shouting the thing you're doing while you're fighting. Let's avoid that next time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not give the bad guys a slight preview of what they're about to get hit with. Yeah, especially when it's a giant ice ball falling from the sky. It might take a couple of seconds. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> yep. But Cyclops, you're sitting up there yelling out optic blast. <laughs> like, and not just a little, like a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like every time and really like that's that's your thing so uh, i did appreciate that when you're fighting magneto at the end uh one of the things if i heard this correctly that he says is just magnetic like i like the idea of him just describing things that way that's sort of his all-purpose adjective for whether he likes something or doesn't like something it's like Ooh. the aloha or the shalom of asteroid m he's just kind of like listening to something like listening to like a band that he just discovered and it's like magnetic exactly yeah yeah I like that. <laughs> How do you think Magneto felt about the Death Magnetic album? Oh, man, you know, as as someone who was super into Metallica in high school and has has attempted to remain a Metallica fan and has had some some trouble doing so, I'm not a very judgmental person. Eric Magnus Lenger or Max Eisenhart, depending on what name you want to use, is a very judgmental person. So mm -hmm. I feel like 
I feel like at that point, you know, Hetfield and Ulrich and everyone just became members of the large collection of human fools that, you know, really just need to submit to mutants and stop trying to make anything of their lives. So do you think maybe they weren't previously to that album? I think, you know, Magneto, I mean, let's think about this. Mm -hmm. He's the master of magnetism. Mm -hmm. Magnetism requires metal. Yep. Therefore, he also puts the word magnet in his name. So I feel like he would appreciate a metal band that put the word metal in their name. Oh, okay. Okay. See, this is, this is making a lot more sense than I would have ever assumed it would. I mean, you know, you just got to read between the lines here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is basically what you do is you you take the comic books and, 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 and you kind of like dissect them and tear them apart and look at their kind of in, uh, individual aspects. And uh, you make good points from that. So, you know what? Uh, bravo for connecting the two of those together. Well, thank you. I mean, I think it's, it's really important to discuss not just the uh, social implications of the X-Men as representatives of minorities that they are not traditionally depicted as uh, in terms of their appearance, mm -hmm. but also the fact that uh, Magneto probably used to be a big Metallica fan. And then calling the album Death Magnetic, uh, you know, probably rubbed him the wrong way also, I think. It's true. It's true. Although uh, after Fatal Attractions, when he comes back from the dead, he does talk about how death no longer has any power over him. So maybe, you know, yeah, maybe that just reminded him of how of how amazing he was. We might have to uh, do an entirely different episode about the relationship between Metallica and Magneto. So I feel like there's a lot to go into yeah, here. There's 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 a lot of there's a lot to go. Yeah. Behind the scenes, we're going to talk about that. But everybody else can listen to some promos for a few other shows. <laughs> Hello, it's Heather from Sunshine and Power Cuts, the podcast that features two types of episodes which alternate. The Sunshine ones offer inspiration drawn from nature, but in the Power Cut ones, I share honest insights into my life living off the power grid in rural New Zealand. If you'd like to check it out, it can be found where good podcasts can be downloaded, and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at SunPowerPod. Until then, be empowered by nature. Hey, 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 it's Carrington from Real Dudes Podcast, and with me I have some fantastic co-hosts. Guys, why don't you introduce yourselves? This is Andrew, coming to you from Lynchburg, Ohio. This is Cody, coming from you also from Ohio. And this is Kyle, coming to you straight from the armpits of West Virginia. We are an indie gaming podcast. We all share a love for games, um, and you can check out our show on Podbean. Uh, just search for Real Dudes Podcast. You can also find us on iTunes, uh, Google Play, um, it, really any of the podcasting outlets that you like to use. Again, that is Real Dudes Podcast. Uh, be sure to check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, if you love video games, you will love our show. Those are some great shows to check out, but first let's finish up with this one. So with this game... I think the most amazing part of it is how well they really capture the essence of Yeah, man, the way the characters move, uh, the movesets that they have, uh, even just the, the level of aggression versus responsiveness of um, close range versus long range, like, they did their homework. Colossus feels like Colossus. Spiral feels like Spiral. Oh, and the Sentinel feels like a robot. The Sentinel is maybe the coolest character in the game. Yeah, yes, uh, Sentinel was 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 my was one of my go to characters uh, for like Marvel versus Capcom, and you never really think about it as you're kind of like jumping into battle, but like you know as you're thinking about how the Sentinel moves, and you know uh, again you know announcing you know the moves as uh, it's doing it. Why why are you doing that Sentinel? But the design the design of sentinel i think is 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 really really impressive once you start kind of like breaking down like exactly how it moves and how rigid it is and just how like quick all of the attacks are even though it's this enormous machine it's it's a really 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 neat character yeah, and I like how um, sort of malleable yet mechanical its body is. The fact that it's got these sort of stabby girder bits and a mm -hmm. giant buzzsaw and rockets. Like, it's all just built in. And yet, even with all that variety, with all that destruction, every move feels so deliberate and precise. Yeah, and, you know, big ups to, like, the animators and developers of, of uh, really this entire series of games because they really took the hardware that they were given and really, really pushed it because a lot of this animation for the, the amount of control that you have and the amount of technicality that is built into these games, the animations are smooth. They look really good. There, 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 there isn't a whole lot that, um, you know, a, a, a lot of previous fighting games, you did a little bit confused as far as like, you know, a lot of the movement where you are, what you were doing at a certain frame. And I think these games just like, as they were refined and refined and refined, just got so impressive to play. 
Yeah, I would agree. And it, it's really cool just seeing like the genesis, but not the genesis, uh, <laughs> of that uh, increasingly fluid, almost liquid, over-the-top action that you would see. Mm-hmm. Like, this seems to be the beginning of of so much of it. This seems to be, you know... It's certainly the first game, fighting game I played, where your character can just rocket like way, way, way off the top of the screen and then come down in a, a, a flurry of blows. Basically, what this era of fighting games w- was was they, they were taking kind of like what everything Street Fighter, you know, did extremely well, and they just wanted to make it more interesting, more engaging, more technical. And we got some amazing fighting games out of out of that formula. Like we were talking earlier about the um, Street Fighter Alpha series. Which yeah. I think did the same thing. It just kind of like refined and refined and refined. And it was just it was gorgeous to look at. It was super fun to play. You know, the 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 arcades were, you know, being machines that only played this game, they were able to tweak like the actual hardware to run this flawlessly. And of course, mm-hmm. compromised versions on consoles. Man, yeah, it's the era of that. <laughs> but you know, big ups to like Capcom and, you know, just their dedication to the genre of fighting games. And I think, you know, even though this wasn't the best one, it's it still had a lot of a lot of the uh, bonuses that uh, the ones and that saying came out this isn't did. the best one mm-hmm. is kind of like saying regular Nintendo isn't the best system, though, because this is what sets the foundation for everything. You can't <laughs> expect true. it to be amazing. Although it is interesting to see, you know, just how how much some of the characters completely survive the transition to the successors of this game. Um, I'm think I, we were talking before the episode about uh, Cyclops in particular. Like mm-hmm. Cyclops, as he appears in the whole Marvel series, uh, it's kind of the same dude. It's kind of the same Ryu of the X Men, like the sort of go to bread and butter uh, fighter. Yeah. So this game it originally came out on arcades, where it was. I hear, in theory, it was amazing there. I have never found one in real life. I actually uh, looked at a couple like websites that like list uh, arcade games. There, this does not exist in Portland, Oregon at all, unfortunately. I really wanted to play it. But. Yeah, seriously. Now, we ended up playing on the PlayStation version, which I've, I've heard is um, not a very good port. But yeah, nothing to really compare it to other than my memories of walking by the console as a kid. I've got the PlayStation and the Saturn versions. Um, I actually have no idea why I got the PlayStation version because I had the Saturn one before I got it. The PlayStation <laughs> one, it's it's so toned down. And I don't know how much of that is because the PlayStation couldn't handle it or how much of it was some other random thing. But the Saturn version, oh man, that thing... From what I can tell from videos anyway, it's pretty darn close to a straight up copy of the arcade version. Oh man, yeah, I would love to play that at some point. I'd love to get a hold of a Saturn in general at some point. There's so many games I missed on that console. Yeah, same, same. And from from what I've seen as well, it, it seems like the graphics on the PlayStation version are a little bit more pixely, a little bit more rough around the edges, whereas the uh, Sega version is much more like cell shaded mm-hmm. much more of the style that you would see in in later iterations of this game yeah and that cell shading does fit especially 90s comics yeah. so well where you have these broad swaths of color but also so much detail so much detail in muscles or the folds of fabric or whatever like it's a cartoon but it's an incredibly realistic cartoon it's stylized but it's stylized in a way that emulates reality without falling uh prey to the uh to the uncanny valley pitfall yeah and even like the like proportions of the characters like we were talking about like colossus and Uh just how like how well they kind of like proportioned out colossus compared to like the other characters because previous to this you had like kind of this kind of street fighter mentality where everyone was essentially the same size like you had your zangief and your chun li that were like the two opposite ends but they weren't like all that different now you have sentinel who is enormous versus you know one of the smaller characters and i think the size really translates really really well and that's another thing that kind of survived into the other iterations and it was something that just gave this game so much power and so much beef and just so much like hard you know kind of like it it, it felt like it hit so much harder because of that right i'm thinking of the juggernaut fight in particular oh absolutely yeah the sentinel's big but juggernaut takes up freaking half the screen he rips up pieces of scenery and hits you with them like so you really get the impression i'm fighting this unstoppable force i'm fighting this just this powerhouse that is so much more than i could ever be and then you do a throw and then cyclops like picks up juggernaut and i guess it's fine (laughs) but still the feel does come through even if it doesn't always quite make sense that was one of my favorite things is just how they kind of like ignored like 
kind of the power level of each like it's like oh no everyone's just about as strong as everybody else right right i mean granted like you know colossus has a little bit more power behind a hit than like iceman does who in my opinion is incredibly underpowered uh in the game but uh yeah the fact that like cyclops just kind of like lifts juggernaut over his head and tosses him and it's like okay no that's the game Fine, great. <laughs> it, we're playing a fighting game we yep. just have to accept Speaking that we're playing of juggernaut, a fighting game <laughs> what if i told you there was a version of the game where you could play as juggernaut What? Oh man, I'm I'm trying to imagine how he would play or how that would even be like a reasonable matchup. Well, you could play as Juggernaut in uh, like Marvel versus Capcom. If you get the Japanese version of the Saturn one, you can play as Juggernaut. But the North American and European oh, so cool. releases, they took that option out. There wasn't like a like a password mode or anything like that because it's it's a little strange that you can play as Akuma in this game and not as Juggernaut. Right. <laughs> There's actually a reason for that. I would like to hear this. Capcom's contract with Marvel said that they had to have a Capcom character in the game. So they stuck in Akuma as a secret character. Okay, and then and at this point, Akuma would have been a relatively new character, right? Am I remembering my fighting game history there? Mm-hmm. Very new. Man. And I gotta say though, like the idea of a demonic martial artist actually fits X-Men pretty well. Yeah. Well, uh, also uh... Akuma was a pretty common like practical joke as well because you would have these like game publications that would tell you like if uh, for example like Resident Evil 2 if you beat the game seven times with only the knife and the handgun you'll be able to restart the game as Akuma and it's (laughs) just like what really (laughs) and then you would have people try to beat Resident Evil 2 with just a handgun and just a knife making it damn near impossible and you know they would have to do that like seven or eight times and then they would get no akuma and you know they would think like i did something wrong at some point during those seven playthroughs i equipped the shotgun accidentally or something and uh you know the fact that like you know they hit akuma you know in in, in as as a hidden playable character you know kind of makes you wonder if they kind of caught wind of that whole like akuma as a practical joke thing and just thought like yeah no one's gonna no one no one's going to believe that Akuma is actually a character you can play. <laughs> right. But in fact, but now I'm trying to think of like what other uh, Capcom or Street Fighter characters could could fit X-Men really well. I M. mean, Bison, I think. Yeah. And Bison would totally work. I yeah. can see, you know, kind of that like magic uh, kind of power that, you know, other characters mm-hmm. in the X-Men universe had. Sure, sure. And, and certainly having uh, mystical crime lords is a very common thing, especially mm-hmm. in Wolverine mm-hmm. comics. Yeah, that's true. So that could work really well. Um, I feel like Colonel Guile and I'm specifically saying Colonel Guile here because I'm talking about the movie from that glorious terrible or the version from the glorious terrible movie. Mm. Uh, he could fit like early 90s X-Men really well. He'd just show up. Just just covered in pouches and guns yeah. and have like not really much personality because he's got pouches and guns. He doesn't need personality and then would be immediately forgotten by the time the next era rolled around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I still love that uh, guy from Belgium played like the all American character. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah. Claude Van Damme. I, I mean, not to get too sidetracked, but dear God, that movie is a thing that was made. They got everything wrong but they still made a movie. <laughs> they did. But I will say Raul Julia, every moment he's on screen elevates that film. Oh, he just chews every piece of scenery up in that, in, in that movie. As, it is glorious. Yes, <laughs> but we digress. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the other yeah, reasons for the exactly. craziness on this game too, is probe entertainment handled the PlayStation version and they're just not good. I, I haven't heard of them. What other things have they done? Well, they specialized in ports, right? Like, they were, like, the port company, if I remember correctly. So, as of when we're recording this, Probe has done the Judge Dredd game and Batman Forever and the Incredible Hulk. You know, not good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, a a, a lot of properties, basically. What we would call nowadays shovelware. But that's pretty much what they were doing. That's fair. (laughs) Unlike the Saturn version, which was a straight-up Capcom production. Mm-hmm. Man, and this is such a Capcom game, too. The uh, soundtrack, in particular, is just the most Capcom freaking thing. Like, I just got all of these glorious visions of an X-Men version of the Mega Man X soundtrack, which is kind of like everything I want in life. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> 
man. But no, there's this there's this specific Capcom sound though. Like it's very video gamey. It's very liquid and fast paced and flowy. And this game has it in spades. Yeah, it has like elements of metal and elements of electronic music, and it's just all high energy all the time. It just uh-huh. dials it to ten and stays there for the entirety of its runtime. And I, I mean, but the thing is, like, that's what made Capcom music great in games. Like even going back to like the um uh the Mega Man series is like you know they were very well known for this like really high energy music and Capcom knew that they had that reputation so they worked to kind of like keep that especially in their fighting games which mm-hmm. is perfect you know for that kind of music yeah I mean you know the score isn't nearly as iconic as say the Street Fighter 2 soundtrack mm-hmm. but I mean what is at the same time yeah absolutely and you know but it but it's still it still pulls that, you know, like I, mm-hmm. I was, I was listening to it and I just started singing a random street fighter song in my head because I thought I could have swore that I heard a street fighter song somewhere in that game, but no, it's just that similar. Yep. They're sort of house style the same way that Marvel has had their house style yep. uh, artistically in different eras. Yeah, absolutely. So overall, what do you think this game gets right? More so from an X-Men side than a fatal attraction side. It captures the feel of every character that it brings in pretty much perfectly like the choice of moves the character design the animation the uh, scale of the characters like you were talking about matt the personality and the powers of each character shines through if you're playing wolverine or psylocke or whatever like you are that character you can just there's not very there's very little suspension of disbelief required to put yourself into the brightly colored shoes of whoever it is you're playing. Uh, similarly, I think some of the levels, some of the backgrounds are incredibly well done and feel very much like X-Men. The danger room that keeps turning into different holographic scenes, very X-Men. The Savage Land, very X-Men. Mojo World, very long shot miniseries, which is to say close enough to very X-Men. <laughs> Um, and and I, I would even say that their move sets are indicative of their personalities as well. You have Wolverine and Colossus that have a lot of move sets that charge in like a, a, a strong component of their moves is forward momentum, uh-huh. which I think is, you know, perfectly um, indicative of how they would actually go into battle. You have like Iceman and Cyclops who don't necessarily have any close range uh, combat options. Like all of them are like keeping them at a distance and making sure that you, you know, uh, a storm has this amazing, like kind of like floaty fly around movements that uh, felt really good. Surprisingly, I didn't feel necessarily too out of control when I was using these moves uh, with storm. And I thought that just the kind of like the floaty nature of her movement uh, was just, you know, a, a, a really great indication of just, her 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 power set and how she would use that in a combat situation so it really felt like they took kind of like the cartoon and comic you know combat scenarios and they thought like how can we design move sets around how they would approach combat in these scenarios uh-huh. well and i especially liked how the characters uh fighting styles like you were just alluding to with storm are so are so different are so varied yeah, it's not just like you have the fast character the slow character the close range the long range you have characters who can literally fly you have psylocke who can create a bunch of uh of psionic false duplicates of herself spiral who can trade places with uh, her opponent Mm -hmm. and that's something that x-men has always been about for me you know you have this group of characters and they all have such disparate powers they're all so different from one another and yet um in the case of the comic you know that makes them a very good team and in the case of a bunch of one-on-one battles it really highlights the differences in their not just you know their x genes but their approaches to battle and their approaches to just like being who they are in general I think Capcom really took this uh, this theme of like designing movesets around the actual character and their personalities and just kind of like as the character roster grew, they had kind of like a more um, kind of varied, you know, choice. You know, one of the great things about, you know, the Marvel versus Capcom series is no matter what your play style is, you had a character that you could play as. Yeah. Even when they got completely out there with, you know, some of their characters, like, you know, like Tron Bon and, you know, like Tron Bon still had a lot of very kind of like careful design decisions being made for her. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, alongside like the personalities and, 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 and the images, uh, the the fact that they were able to actually like tackle the personality of the character in the moveset, I think is super impressive. 
Yeah, there aren't any yeah, booths absolutely. I'm expecting people to have that aren't there. Um, e- even the way they have the button layouts for pulling them off just seems to make sense with what the move is. It's just a testament to how good Capcom is with this genre of games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially by this point in their history, they had just learned so much of how to make that work. They've, they had polished it so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, they they were the creators of this genre. And so it makes sense that they were just like leagues ahead of everybody else. You know, I think uh, you had a claim that did Mortal Kombat, which was a thing all to itself. And it, it really felt like, you know, the, the, the people that tried, you know, kind of like jumping into like the Capcom game, like trying to make that that kind of Street Fighter-esque fighter game. Like you had a game like World Heroes for Neo Geo, which was awful. You know, and it was basically a, a, a Street Fighter ripoff. But then you had Capcom constantly iterating on this like really successful uh, kind of base product. Sure. And I mean, you know, you can see that doing you can see them doing that in other directions as well. If I'm recalling correctly, wasn't uh, the Dungeons and Dragons side scrolling beat em up a Capcom game as well? I do not know. You're 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 exiting my my knowledge of Capcom <laughs> games. I could be completely misremembering, okay. but I do appreciate how when they do an adaptation of something, mm-hmm. they don't just do the Capcom style with an X Men coat of paint on it or whatever. Mm-hmm. They they really think about okay, what makes X Men X Men? What makes Wolverine Wolverine and Omega Red Omega Red? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's definitely like this kind of attention to detail that, I mean, you don't necessarily find in a whole lot of other. Um, like property based games, you know, like there were a bunch of other X-Men games and none of them necessarily captured personality. And it's, it's kind of funny to say that like, Hey, this game without a necessarily like a plot or a story actually, you know, captured personalities better than actual plot driven games. But in in some ways it did. And Mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting. Yeah. And talking also about what works, what makes this work as an X-Men adaptation. I mean, we touched upon it before, but what little plot there is, the characters all sound like the characters. They feel like the characters, what they do in their endings, like Logan going off to fight Silver Samurai to blow off steam after Jean Grey rejects him in favor of Cyclops. So he just like he he slashes up this pile of flowers that was just there. For, I, I don't it's know. great. Oh, so good. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, these are all roughly what the characters would do if they were in a situation like this. Iceman goes to the beach and makes ice sculptures of of the beachgoers showing off his abilities. Like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that that's a Bobby Drake thing. Spiral uh, is doing the whole thing for ratings and then decides to talk to Mojo about um, how destroying the Earth would get even better ratings as, as their next project. And so, yeah, it's... Every time it has the opportunity to feel like X-Men, it feels like X-Men. Yeah. And what do you think this game gets wrong? I think most of what this this game gets wrong is a little bit more tied to the actual like game mechanics. So there's very few options you you get like right as you start the game, you know, you have like an arcade mode, you have versus mode, you have options, but you do have a sound select, uh, like a sound test option, which uh, as a kid, Matt just fell in love with. So of course, <laughs> as Miles and I were playing the game, I had to run through a couple of the sound effects and just go like, oh, this is cool. All right, awesome. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, uh, I, I, again, it's, it's, it's really hard to make these kind of uh, judgments of this game because it was the first one like this was a little bit of kind of a what can we do what can we get away with you know how exactly can we make a game like this to make it successful and make it so that like n- you know uh, comic book fans and non-comic book fans alike enjoy playing this game so I mean the fact that it, it was so stripped down that there was kind of this like smaller roster of characters um, really kind of it's a little bit more of a testament to how early this game was as opposed to what they got wrong necessarily. Hopefully I'm making sense when I say that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Because I think for me, what I wanted to see was just, yeah, I wanted to see more characters pulling from this vast roster of X-Men heroes and villains. I wanted to see when you have a mirror match, when you have like, you know, Wolverine versus Wolverine, maybe one could be wearing the yellow costume and one could be wearing the brown and orange. 
But I think really what I wanted to see was more plot and more character work. Mm -hmm. What we do see in the ending works really well. And I think just adding a couple more scenes, maybe at the beginning of a character's arcade mode, halfway through, or if they fight like a character who is specifically their rival, that would have felt it, that would have made it feel a lot more like an X-Men story rather than just X-Men trappings on a version of the fighting game genre. Mm -hmm. But like you were saying, Matt, I mean, this is one of the first games to do this at all. So, like, can you really blame it? I give them a lot of credit for being as kind of forward thinking as they were. Because, you know, putting like putting the X-Men in a fighting game. I mean, if I didn't think of it as a kid as like kind of like a dream scenario, like it's a kid's dream scenario. It's like, oh, my God, we can finally settle the 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 question of like who would win in a fight, Juggernaut or Colossus. And this is before we get the MCU and and all of like the Marvel movies that kind of answer that for us. So, you know, uh, being able to actually like do, you know, like uh, witness this as a kid and play these games and see, the you know, put these scenarios together uh is just really fantastic and and you know hats off to capcom you know i mean for you know basically like both inventing and refining the modern fighter genre so you know <laughs> hats off to you yeah because the plot stuff is really the only thing that's coming to mind too and i wouldn't even really think about it if some of these earlier more simple games hadn't have had some kind of plot thing between fights yeah yeah it did really feel like a gap as compared to and, and i'm showing my lack of knowledge of the fighting game timeline here. But I know even um, some of the later versions of Street Fighter 2, uh, certainly the Street Fighter Alpha series, had a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yeah, Alpha came out definitely after this, too. I mean, they've been releasing versions of 2 for, it seems like, the past 90 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, yeah. And then finally, if you had somebody who wanted to get into X-Men, I probably don't have to ask you this, but would you hand them this game as a bit of a primer course? <laughs> if they were fighting game fans then yes absolutely this would be a great way to get them intrigued by the characters and the scenarios if they cared more about things like you know plot eh, maybe not so much but for a fighting game fan sure and I would even, you know, go a step farther to say, like, you know, someone who is kind of like tangentially familiar with the X-Men, actually introducing them to characters like Omega Red and Silver Samurai and Spiral um, are all really, really, really cool things. Because I I know, like, my my big introduction to the greater X-Men universe were, were the trading cards. Yeah. And so I knew about Spiral. I, you know, I knew about Omega Red, even though I hadn't necessarily read storylines, you know, featuring them or they hadn't quite made their appearance. Uh, you know, Omega Red, I think, was uh, was on the cartoon. He hadn't quite made his appearance on the cartoon. But I think they made a really, really good decision in including these kind of like, I don't know if I want to call them like third tier, like X-Men characters or maybe even like second tier villains or something like that um but you know I, I i really think this is a great kind of like jumping off point into getting more involved with the universe and getting more familiar with the characters and because there were some like all of these are really really excellent characters and then you even have exodus at the end you even have exodus <laughs> at the end despite his complete lack of of any dialogue so that is a good point yeah that's something that um they really went the extra mile here in just in including Exodus at all, despite his lack of lines mm -hmm. and in choosing the playable characters that they did. And yeah, I like that we get, you know, spiral from the multiverse. We get the Sentinel from the whole mutants are hated and feared thing. We get Omega red from the shadowy government organizations making mutant operatives. Like we're getting little peeks into a lot of different corners of the X universe. And even if they're not really explained, they can certainly pique somebody's interest and get them to, you know, find X, X-Men volume two, number six or whatever, if they wanted to see more Omega Red or and stuff like that. Yeah, because Spiral is a really bizarre character in this game. And I think her alone is going to make people just say, like, what? Wait, what? who? Who is this? What? <laughs> Why can she conjure energy swords out of nowhere and teleport around and turn into all the other playable characters when she does a certain combo? That was so cool. God, that was cool. <laughs> I mean, if you had somebody who wanted to get more into the plot side of things, would you have any suggestions for them, like maybe a podcast or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they were interested in something along those lines, they could certainly go to explainthexmen.com or their podcatcher of choice and check out Jay and Miles' Explain the X-Men, where we talk about these characters, these settings, and so many more. Yeah, uh, basically same, same suggestion, same thing. Yeah. <laughs>
I mean, y'all have been my go-to for like the past five years, so I'm not going to change that now. Ah, <laughs> thank you. No, we uh, we do our best, and um, I think we've covered at this point thirty years of continuity from 1963 to 1993, and we are really just scratching the surface after five years of of running our show. Yeah, just in case anybody can't remember whether it's X with an EX or X with an X. One, it is X with just an X because it's the 90s. Of course it is. But also there will be a link down in the show notes because clicking links is easier than spelling. It totally is. Agreed. Although I'm just going to say we also did spend the 13 bucks and get explain the X-Men.com with the E at the beginning. So the choice is yours. Wow. Really going the extra mile there. The extra mile. Hey, the extra miles. Hey. Um, okay, that's too far. <laughs> <laughs> or not far enough. Oh, my God. No, thanks again to both of you for coming on. I've been looking forward to this one for a really long time, and I hope I can find another excuse to get both of you on. Yeah, Chris, thank you so much for having us. This has been a blast, like revisiting this game and talking to you about it. I I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, this really gave me an excuse to kind of like dig into the dusty corners of my memory and do a little bit of research that I probably wouldn't have been able to do uh, for other reasons. Uh, but yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having us on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it seems to be a common thread here is guests having family members not being able to give them crap for playing old games. I'm doing it for podcast research. I have to. Yes, making the world a better place for, for gamers and comics fans alike. And it gave us an excuse to uh, to hang out, which I don't think we do enough, often enough. So, yeah, all good things have uh, have come from this uh, from this one episode. Well, if you want to hear more things from me, you can head on over to Twitter at Play Comics Cast, the Facebook group, which one day I'll remember how to tell you what it is. There will be a link down in the show notes, and there's links all over PlayComics.com <laughs> if you want to see that. You can head on over to the merch store. There's also a link down in the show notes to that where you can get some stuff to help support the show or you can head on over to the patreon which for a dollar a month you can hear the outtake reels take all the things that i throw at the end of the episode times a million because you know i'm not giving you the best ones there <laughs> I, i'm going to be very curious to hear uh, what makes it into the final cut and what doesn't of our assorted ramblings in this episode oh absolutely also don't forget that we're now a part of the gunna geek network home to such wonderful shows as better podcasting where you can listen to a podcast about podcasting and learn how to podcast. Go figure. Who knew that everybody would be able to do that? But, you know, they give great advice. So it's a wonderful show. You should go check it out. And if you like the wonderful music that we're talking over right now, I don't know how rude of us. We'll get over it because you can head on over to soundcloud.com slash day and listen to all of his music. But most of all, just go grab a game, grab a stack of comics and find yourself a new favorite character. Thank you. I mean, I think it's it's really important to discuss not just the uh, social implications of the X-Men as representatives of minorities that they are not traditionally depicted as uh, in terms of their appearance, but also the fact that uh, Magneto probably used to be a big Metallica fan.